retested this to try to see if there's going to be a better way to look for parasites throughout fecal manure. And guys, this is it, especially when it comes to your strongylids and your coccidia. So if we're worried about barber pole worm, this is one of the things that they're going to do. If you take it into the vet's office, they're going to perform this procedure and charge you anywhere from 15 to $30 a head. So how many people usually rely on your vet for, to kind of screen for fecal parasites? Yeah, um, <laughs> it's, it's a pretty simple procedure as long as you know how to do it and you have you know, a microscope and a place to do it. So when we get started, like I said, really the only two things that we're gonna screen these goats for with this process is gonna be your strongylids, your barber pole worm, um, a couple of your other round worms, and then your coccidia, your Omeria species. Unfortunately, in sheep and goats, there's like seven to nine different species that can infest those. And if you've got one and you turn around and bring another buck in and oops, he's got another one, there's a good chance all your goats are gonna have it. So that's when they've talked about don't buy your worms, don't buy your parasites in general. And so with our samples, what we do, and we go through two, 300 um, mature does and then kids at the same time. In the procedure, they're using the gloves that they use to pull from the animal. We use plastic baggies. Sandwich baggies, as you can tell, are kind of an overkill. You can use a snack size baggies. Some people use <laughs> coin baggies. Um, but this way, you can write straight on them with permanent marker. We have the ID, and a lot of times, we'll go ahead and put the date on there. You can also make notes in these bags when you're going through the samples. Works great. Now, the sample that we need has to be fresh. And what I mean by that is it neither needs to be taken directly from the animal, which a lot of people don't like to do, especially on their younger animals, or it needs to be picked up as soon as it's deposited out of the animal. And why I say that is don't wait an hour. Don't wait two or three hours. We had a lady that came in for one of the parasite screenings during the spring. She picked up some as soon as she fed, and then she thought she didn't have enough, and so went back to her concrete floor barn that gets sprayed down once a week, picked it up again from the same goat, barely any roundworms, to she should have a dead goat, just from that sample being there an extra couple of hours. So if you, because we don't want to worm when we don't have to, right? We want to try to keep resistance out of our herd, so we want to have an accurate count. These guys can be thrown in your refrigerator. That's another reason you use baggies, because we can throw them in another gallon baggie and then throw them in the bottom of the fridge. We can bring the crisper door, clean the fridge out. It's going to be perfectly fine. If you freeze these guys, it's actually going to cause the eggs to burst. They're not going to float to the top. And so you may have one that looks like she's healthy and parasite free, and she could have a lot of parasites in her. So if you're going to do this, you can put it in a fridge, but not a freezer. I would not leave it out in room temperature for more than a couple hours, however, or your eggs are going to hatch. And I've done this for years. It's hard to gross me out. But when I see a worm go across the microscope slide, I get a little wigged out and I've got to go wash my hands and use a tub of Germex. So just kind of keep those things in mind. When we're talking about materials, it's pretty kind of straightforward. So we have our fecal sample, right? We've got to have something to look at. We just can't go, well, we're going to look, look at the picture of the goat and we're going to count how many parasites are inside of it. We can't do that. We've got to actually have the fecal sample. We're going to have a scale. So the cheap little Walmart digital scales, a lot of times you can catch them online for $5, especially this time of year, um, are great. I would not use your kitchen scale that you're going to go and cut grapes in for your lunch later down the week. I would have one specifically for um, your barn, specifically that is animal use only. Cups, what we use are the little Dixie drinking bathroom cups. You need the smallest size, I think they're two ounces, uh, milliliter, fluid milliliters, whatever. Those are gonna be perfectly fine. These small plastic ones, you can write directly on them. Some of the larger ones that are wax, the Sharpie will come off of. So especially if you're doing a lot of these in a setting, you can kind of mix up samples and that may not be too good. Measuring cups, a little cheap measuring cup. This will get you through the lifetime of your goats. Um, and we're gonna use this not only to make our fecal solution later in the guide, but also to measure other things out. Droppers, these plastic droppers, single use, you can get them on Amazon, usually in groups of hundreds for like 10 bucks and they'll ship them straight to your door. Um, as long as you've got some kind of dropper that you can wash out thoroughly, 
you're good to go. We have glass reusable ones that we use inside of our lab. Stir stick, we take craft sticks, cut them in half, and we're good to go. What this is going to do is break up the fecal manure. It's going to get it to the strainer without you having to touch it. Probably one of the thing that can kind of be an aggravation is your strainers. So as long as it's a fine mesh strainer, whether it's fit your sink, whether it's a T strainer, it doesn't matter as long as it's the finer mesh. Because what this is doing is taking the heavier material, the browse they've eaten, kind of the fibrous material that's went through the animal, it's straining it out of the liquid and letting the true liquid and the parasite eggs go straight on through. Um, yeah? It is, however, when you get to that stage, and that's what I was going to bring up, is a lot of people use cheesecloth because they can get it really fine and have several layers. What you're going to end up in, if you do not clean it well enough and get the rest of the debris and the eggs that may have stuck to that fibers, is you may get false readings down the road. That's fine. I mean, if that's, if that's what you want to work. Um, just get to thinking of if you're going to use a small cup like this, it's going to be hard to get that liquid to stay in the cup. It's going to be all over your table. Um, and hopefully you have better ones because I was like, yeah, let's not buy coffee filters. Let's use one of those. I made two pots of coffee in one day and it died on me. So sometimes they're not worth the wear and tear. But it's kind of dealer's choice, whatever you want to use, go for it. A microscope, that's probably going to be your largest purchase when it comes to this. Um, a lot of times people will get them when the high school is redoing their science department, the junior college is redoing their science department. You can get refurbished microscopes online, however, that's going to cost you about $200, $250. So if this is not something that you're going to do on down the low road, if you don't have another use for it, you kind of have to weigh the pros and cons. The second probably most needed thing is a McMaster slide. And this was a type of microscope slide that was made directly for this procedure. And we've got, we'll be able to handle them and you'll get a closer look at them. But it's got a specific chamber that can only hold so much of our poop water. It's got lines so you can count to see how many eggs. And they have taken that specific chamber and that can tell you per gram of fecal manure how many eggs are coming out of that animal. How many parasites are residing in that animal. We can get down to very, very precise and accurate numbers. That's another one of these things. They've done, redone it for years, try to find an easier method, a better method. This is the method. Um, another thing is our solution. We usually make it in-house. It's really easy. We use Epsom salts in tap water. There is a product available that you can buy online. Valley Vet used to sell it, I'm not sure if they still do, called Fecosol. That's probably what your vet is using. Um, and all this is is really, really salty water that's gonna allow those eggs to float. Um, think of it as if I go out to the Cimarron River, the Arkansas River, I'm gonna sink to the bottom like a stone. I don't float very well. I go out to the Gulf and I'm a happy little camper because I can float all day and never have to put any effort into it. So that salt water is going to allow those eggs to float up where they have to be in order for us to see them very well in these lines. You can also use sugar, can't you? Because all you're doing is specific gravity. Yes, your specific gravity, we're wanting it at a certain point. The reason we don't use sugar with the McMaster slides is it is really, really messy. We have to use it for other parasites. However, the salt water, especially as many as these we go through, is a lot more user friendly. When we have to go through and do horse, certain horse parasites or certain cattle parasites, then yes, we do have to use sugar water, and I absolutely hate it. Um, so we, we generally stay with the salt water. But in that guide, I think they give the recipe for the sugar solution as well. Um, so the times 10, but you've got to be careful. Most of the time, a compound microscope is going to be set how you need it. So it's going to be a times 10 and then whatever is going through your viewfinder, which a lot of times the, the what goes through your optical piece is what gets you. And a lot of times they'll send them with interchangeable. So I have a microscope, but I want to include in the budget for the farm this year a new microscope. But the, the thing that seems really important is that mechanical uh, stand, yes. right? Because you have to move the thing through the little... So that's another thing. If you're, you can buy a $90 microscope on Amazon. It'll have one eyepiece and it'll get you the right magnification. However, you're going to have to move it itself. And that was something I was going to bring up when I can actually show you the mechanical slide. 
or because I mean, yeah, it's a stage. It's a nice flat platform. We're gonna put the slide right on it. However, it'd be to be able to move it is a lot easier than trying to move it with your fingers. And ooh, I lost my place. I went over too many columns. I've got to start over. So that's a good point to make. So when we're making the solution, like I said, the commercially available solution is called Fecasol. Valley Vet was selling it. I wasn't sure. You can type it in. I think there's um, the same places that you can go and order McMaster slides. If you don't like Amazon, um, they give the two companies that you can go online and order them through. Those companies are also going to sell the solution. However, I'm going to take my Epsom salt and do 125 grams, which I meant to look up to see. I think it's close to a third of a cup. That's where your scale comes in handy. 500 milliliters of warm tap water. Um, and most of the time that salt's going to dissolve really easily, very quickly. You're not going to have any issues out of it. Sometimes you're going to have to heat it up. Just don't boil it. If you boil it, then the water goes out and you've got all kinds of messes. Um, distilled water, there's a lot of people who don't want to use their tap water. Um, that's fine. Use the drinking water, not the distilled water. The distilled water is went through a process. It's going to take out some of the naturally occurring ions. That's going to mess with the salt. That's going to mess with the specific gravity. So just grab a bottle of Arzarka <coughs> water out of the gas station, whatever, tap water, you're going to be fine, just not the distilled water. And the eggs are not going to float how they should. So I mean, it's really simple. You just put the two together, you stir. If you need heat, great. If you don't, it's ready to go. Do you have any questions on the solution? Did you say uh, valleyvet.com is where you can get the uh, pizza salt? At one point, I'm not sure if they're still selling it. They went through and changed a lot of their inventory. Okay. Um, in that procedure, the USDA guide has two places that sell the McMaster slides. Um, they also sell the Fecosol. I do not know if Fecosol is available on Amazon yet. Okay. Um, and usually Amazon has kits that they'll sell through the other company that you'll get beakers and the pipettes and all kinds of stuff and just not the, the slides. And it usually costs you less than $10 a slide, which used to, it was like $25 a slide. <laughs> so uh, it, it's getting better. I've not seen a difference in it. I've done it with hard water, well water. I've done it with all kinds, and I don't see that big of a difference. Just the distilled water has been through a whole another process. So like I said, we are going through the USDA protocol. That's what we're going to use in the lab. These are just Kylie's notes to keep yourself sane. And this is through a major trial and error. This is me teaching other people and going, OK, well, they don't understand this as easily. This sometimes is easier to do. One of the biggest things I can tell you is before you get started, make sure you have all your stuff and you have a big enough place to work. OK, just if you've got a folding table and that's going to be your barn table, use it. That's fine. You should have more than enough space. So another thing is label your cups when they're empty. If you drink as much caffeine as I do or as much of a Butterfingers, you are going to wear whatever is in this cup if you try to write on it, especially if you're doing more than one sample. Um, so just go ahead, label both of them with whatever that ID number is, and have them ready to go. Second thing is a lot of these digital scales are going to have more than one function. Make sure that it's set to grams and not ounces. That was one thing my tech this year, going to showing him how we do some certain parasite. He goes through a bunch of them and goes, man, I just don't see anything. And I'm going, wait a minute. This is the first time we've done this. There should be several of these animals that are way, way parasite load. Got to look and he was using the scale in ounces instead of grams. So make sure that the technology doesn't get the better of you. Some days it does to all of us. Most of the time I can't operate my phone before the second cup of coffee. So um, another thing is when you're, you've got everything in the baggie, now your baggie is your best friend. You can sit here and break these pellets up. You can get everything meshed around. Um, think of it, every pellet that comes to that animal is going to be a little bit different, right? Um, so one may have more of a certain type. The parasites are going to get stuck in another one. So what we want to do is when we're collecting from that animal, don't get one or two pellets. Yeah, that may be two grams and what you need to run the solution, but it needs to be a little bit more than that. But while it's in the baggie, we can go ahead and crush everything up. We can make sure that everything's mixed. We're just not working off of one or two pellets. Make sense to everybody? Okay. You mentioned you, you could put it like in a crisper, keep it cool. What's a, what's a shelf life on that? I've done them eight months after they were taken. 
Some of them had started to larvate, but it's usually the quicker you do it, the better. You're going to have a more accurate count. Uh, the older the sample is, it's just like everything. It's still usable, but uh, it's not the greatest. It's not a hot rush type thing. Yeah. Happens, yeah, I mean, it, as long as you've got it by a week, two weeks, it's probably just as good as if you did it the day of. Um, but we've got some that's been sitting in the freezer. You can take them too and like put them in a cooler out in the barn or something mm -hmm. and then bring them to the house. Um, as long as the cooler stays cool enough, you'll be fine. If not, you'll have a lot of larvae swimming around. Yeah, okay, thank you. Not a problem. And gloves. So and this is, I'll say this more than one time today, but the parasites that we're dealing with, especially looking for in this procedure, are harmless to humans. But just like when we worry about parasites and diseases in certain animals, really young, really old, anybody who's got any kind of immune compromised situation, whether you've got a cold, allergies, whatever else, things happen. <laughs> um, there was a really, really high ranking lab. The lab manager actually um, was infected, had an abnormal infection of the barber pole worm and it took him about eight months of him being in the hospital before they figured it out. What he was doing was washing his coffee cup in the same sink that he was washing everything else in. So kind of, kind of keep ahead of ourselves and kind of use common sense. That's why I hide my coffee cup if I'm not in the lab and the tech's doing what he needs to, because um, I don't trust anybody. So make sure that if you've got a barn sink, use it. If not, bleach it. I mean, kind of use, kind of use, because we are dealing with fecal matter. That's not the only parasites we've got to worry about. There's different um, bacteria. There's other things that can be in that. There's something that the goat may have funky going on that will be able to transmit to humans. So just kind of keep that in the back of your minds. But what we're going to do is we're just going to measure out two grams. Get everything where it needs to be. And rule of thumb, and you'll understand why I'm trying not to laugh, is two grams is typically about the tip of your thumb. From your joint to the end, that's going to be usually around two grams. I know a lot of vets, they don't even weigh it. They just go through it, add, add what they think is necessary. So we're just going to take our handy little thing and go through. Sometimes it's easier to use a plastic spoon. Um, however, you're just going to go through a lot of them, and these are a lot cheaper. When I'm at my in-law's house and doing it for their goats, I'll lay a plastic... Um, tablecloth down and then do this because like I've said before I'm kind of a butterfingers everything is going to go everywhere have our measuring cup we're going to do 28 milliliters per sample and what this is going to do is it's going to be just enough that those eggs are going to be able to um, get mashed up and float so we put everything in there take our stick kind of swirl it around. It's pretty much broken up, but we need to make sure it gets incorporated in the water. And then it's going to sit there for at least five minutes. And what that's going to do is give the eggs enough time to break away from that fecal manure and rise up to the top. Then once that happens again, we're going to stir it up and we're going to fill our slide. And I've already done this one, so we didn't have to wait on anything. When we're filling our slide, don't be overconfident. So the first couple of times I did this, I was like, oh, I've got five slides, I'm gonna fill all five of them up. You've got about an hour before you start having issues with the salt water evaporating. That's gonna cause crystals on your slides and your eggs are gonna start to sink. Um, so do it one, two at a time until you get really confident and then you can just ease through them. Usually I can get through five or six in an hour um, saying that you don't have something that's completely hot where there's just thousands upon thousands of eggs in there. But what we're gonna do Okay, so the biggest thing on air bubbles, and this is one of those kind of Kylie's headache things, is tilt it just a little bit and fill it from the bottom, fill it slowly. Make sure that you've got enough fluid in that pipe pet. Most of the time they're going to be able to fill both chambers. Make sure you don't have air bubbles in the pipe pet when you start. But if you'll tilt it just a little bit, not straight up and down, but just enough that the fluid is not going to come back out of the chambers, but that it's just going to kind of push up and ease through. And as you can tell on most of my little headache things, it's don't knock over the cups because then you've got to start all over and you've got poo water all over your table.
and floor and yourself. So the second biggest thing is make sure that when they're waiting to set on the level surface. One thing that we've noticed, a lot of times they'll set them on top of paper towels or whatnot. If they're tilted, then the eggs aren't going to float straight up to the chambers, they're going to float up straight up to the deal and you're not going to count those. Um, and so that's one thing we went through and redone a bunch of samples because we noticed that, well, they're not a lot to where we're supposed to be counting in our grid. However, we noticed on the edge that there was a lot of eggs where they were not supposed to be, and we're not supposed to count those. So we redid it. Yes, because it was off balance. So little, little things like that <laughs> save a lot of time. Um, and I've got one microscope in there. Whoever gets that microscope, I have to apologize. It's covered <laughs> in salt water, and I didn't realize it until you brought it out this morning. But when we're putting the slides on, be very careful not to tip it onto the microscope. Because unfortunately, microscopes are hard to clean. They have a lot of moving parts. Uh, it's not one of those things that you can just take out to the barn and hose down. <laughs> so this one's about ready, and I'm going to have to adjust. Haha, -ha, there we are. And these were samples that we took out of our lab um, <coughs> that we did for the sheep and goat barn at OSU. And so there, when we first did it, there were several, several parasites in it. Why is it not focusing? <coughs> so the good thing about air bubbles, if you do get air bubbles, it's a lot easier to focus. <coughs> if not, you kind of have to watch for the side. There's going to be two chambers full of fluid. Each of those two chambers have a blue square with six columns each in it. And what we're going to do is be consistent. We're going to stop at, start at the top, go down, over, back up, left, right. If you want to count the left one first and the right one second, it does not matter as long as you do it every time. So it's kind of like playing baseball, riding a horse, riding a bike. As long as you do everything the same time and do it consistently, you're going to be fine. But if we want to stand on our head and count it with one hand and then count it with the other <laughs> eye, it's not going to work. We do have a calculation. We use an Excel spreadsheet that we keep up with all of our hair sheep, meat sheep, whatever we're doing, the goat barn. We keep up with that animal throughout the entire summer. If we take it every two weeks versus every month versus every other month, um, we know when we did that. You can take the scrapies tag, because your scrapies tag is not going to change. You can take your ID tag. You can take a name. I have a friend. She has close to 20 goats now. She knows every one of them by name. They all look the same to me. But what we're looking for is a treatment threshold. For the strongylid, for the barb pole worms, we're looking for one. For the coccidia, we're looking for the other. Your coccidia, typically you're going to have a higher threshold before you want to worm. So this is one thing a lot of people don't like using this versus the Fomacha because it takes time to do and then you've got to go back, bring your goats back up, bring out the one that was high and redo <coughs> it. Um, but this way, you're only treating the animals that need it. You're not treating everybody when Ipsy Bitsy number 23, your granddaughter's favorite goat, is the only one that needs the wormer. Make sense? So it takes time, but it saves you in the end. Um, so when we're looking at our parasites, this is what the microscope should look like. We've got a blue line, we're going to have blue chambered lines, it's going to be the opposite way, and we're looking through this field of vision. Your air bubbles are going to look like these small black dots, your eggs are going to be on the same plane of view as your air bubbles. They're at the top of the slide, they're up against the plastic. All the microscopes back there, I went through and kind of put them through there, but I have really weird eyes, so when everybody gets back through there, we'll find focus the microscope and make sure that everything comes into view. We don't want to get to the end and go, well, I didn't see anything, and I look at the microscope and it's completely fuzzy. Um, a lot of times, like Dr. Talley was talking about, we're not going to see anything. It's going to be a lot of debris. It's going to be a lot of debris. We're going to have to pick these guys out. So in this slide, we've got some strongylids, barbacle worm, 
This guy is also a nematode. He's a special species. Typically, we don't have issues out of the species. He's not one we have to worry about. However, we count him because he is a blood feeder. He is going through the animal and causing animal issue. A lot of times we're going to see this. It's not going to see much. You might have one. Coccidia are really tiny compared to your strongylid eggs. Um, a lot of times you're going to have debris. You're going to have parts of worms that are come up and you'll be like, man, this looks like it should be something animal. Um, one of the biggest things that's going to bother you and this is the reason we take it straight from the animal or very fresh is pollen in early spring of the year and during the summer looks very suspicious. Um, looks very similar. It's round. It's going to look like it should be a parasite egg, but a lot of times it's not. Um, so that's one reason we take it directly from the animal. The less we have to worry about those other things that are trying to confuse us. Some more pictures. A lot of times it's just going to be nothing and one egg. So if you go through a sample and you're like, it's in focus, but I didn't have anything. That's good. Hey, we're great. We're good. As long as you went through the steps and you took care of the protocol like you should, you're fine. A lot of times we go through and at the end of the deal, we may have only three goats or three sheep or whatever that may have had more than 10 parasite eggs on the entire slide. Those are not on the threshold. Those are way under threshold. We're not worried about those. Those are healthy, healthy. Their immune system's doing what it should. <coughs> So it, it depends. So like Dr. Talley's already talked about, Dr. Whitworth's talked about, depending on your schedule. If it's spring break and that's the only time you're going to have help to come wrangle the goats, that's usually my job, um, then do it then. And then if you're going to reworm in the fall before you turn everything out on winter pasture, do it again then. If you've got the help and you've got the ability, do it once a month. But do it before you worm. And that's, that's aggravating, it takes time, you've got to get the animals back up. But um, between breeds, between lines of breeds, everyone's different. So we have one, I can tell you who it is, and every one of her daughters at the OSU range, every year, every single time, she's going to look so anemic that she should be dead. Never has a parasite problem. So if you're warming just on the FAMACHA score, you're, you're wasting your warmer. You're contributing to the resistance. I've got some black Spanish that my family has. Their buck, you are never going to look at him anemic. We pulled fecal on him, and I went, oh, my gosh, we need to stop now. Worm everything. Don't touch the ground inside your barn. Keep, keep the nieces and nephews out of the barns right now. So we're using this tool on top of everything else. So keep it in mind. So whenever you think about worming, you need to be thinking about doing this test. You need to think about doing the FAMACH test. Don't do it just because the feed store had cell and warmer. That, that's, that's my in-laws still point of view.